Two, the two faces sitting opposite of me in the booth looked up at my curse, staring with quizzical amusement. The first, an extremely attractive looking woman of about 19, smirked as she saw me gazing at my watch. What's the matter, Billy? She asked, her voice carrying the thick British accent, which I had become used to the last few weeks. Are you going to turn back into a pumpkin at midnight? Her companion, a guy about the same age, choked slightly on the beer he'd been downing. Dropping it to the wooden table with a clunk, he wiped at his mouth with the sleeve of his jumper, still sputtering. For my part, I simply continued to stare at my watch, as if willing the two hands to begin running backward. Finally, I lowered it and stared at the two. I didn't realize how late it got, I said, my mind beginning to race. The woman, Courtney, gave a small shrug. So, what's the big deal? This place won't close for another hour or so, I shook my head. You don't get it. I promised my folks I'd get my ass back no later than 12.30. This is the first time they've ever let me stay out so late. If I don't get back there, I'm toast. Both of them let out barks of laughter. What is it with American parents being such bloody killjoys? Eric asked. I had no answer to give. I simply shook my head as I pulled my wallet out and withdrew a 10 pound note from it. Tossing it down, I slid to my feet, the world tilting slightly from the alcohol in my system. I honestly don't know man, but I do know I've got a vamoose before I end up screwed, especially if the three of us still wanna hit the movies this weekend. At my words, Courtney jerked her head up to look at me, a sly smile slowly slid across her face, and she leaned over slightly, sliding her hand on top of mine as her blue eyes twinkled. Then you better get yourself home, haven't you? She said, her voice taking on a slightly husky tone, because your cute ass is going to the pictures with me to see Godzilla. One way or another, I felt my cheeks burn slightly at the flirt, then found my voice. Yeah, I should. You have the phone number and address I gave you. She nodded, pulling a folded sheet of paper from her pocket. Satisfied, and with a final exchange of later, I slung my backpack over my shoulder and headed for the exit. As soon as I stepped outside, I was hit with a torrent of rain. Great, still downpouring. Sighing, I flipped the collar of my leather jacket up and began jogging. It was the summer of 1998 and my parents had decided to take my two younger siblings and I to see our aunt and uncle in London. It was our first time visiting another country, and to me at least, it felt like visiting a parallel dimension, one where the same language was spoken, but everything else was different. At first, I loved the tours of places like the Tower of London and St. Paul's Cathedral, but I quickly got tired of it, wanting to get out on my own and experience it as only an 18-year-old on the loose could. And after much pleading and promising to behave, I'd finally been given the go-ahead. I was given 50 pounds to spend, along with fare for the trains and buses and told to have fun. But my mother had begun, her tone deadly serious, your father and I expect you to be back here no later than 12.30. You break curfew and you can forget being let out on your own again, am I clear? I'd agreed enthusiastically, promising I would. And in truth, I had fully intended to keep my word. I just hadn't intended on meeting Courtney and Eric in Trafalgar Square. Though when I'd locked eyes with the blonde bombshell across the square, sitting on the edge of the fountain in a tight skirt, I couldn't resist. The three of us spent the rest of the day just walking about the city, hitting up stores and eventually ending up at a pub where they delighted in buying me the first ever legal alcohol I'd had. And now, here I am running about like a chicken with its head cut off, trying to find a way back to Chelsea before I end up dead meat. I shook my head, trying to clear the slightly fuzziness in my vision as I raced towards the bright lights and blaring car horns of Piccadilly Circus. A moment later, I was awash in the neon signs advertising Foster's Beer, Sanio Electronics, and Coca-Cola. This late at night, the square had emptied out considerably, though a number of people still streamed around, their faces hidden under umbrellas as they pushed past me. My eyes flickered first to a red double-decker bus as it passed by, then a black cab which was letting out the 
most goth couple I had ever seen. I felt a slight anxiety, even though I knew full well I was legally able to drink. Years of being raised in the states and constantly reminded of what would happen if we were caught drinking before turning 21 gnawed at me. I don't exactly feel comfortable taking a cab tipsy and don't even know how to get one of the buses to stop. Feeling the anxiety begin to fill me as I again glanced at my watch, I spared a final look around. That's when my eyes fell upon the sign for the underground across from me. As soon as I spied the large red circle with white lettering showing the way, I remembered the ticket in my pocket. Of course, I took it to get here and since it's an all day ticket, I can use it until midnight. My mind made up, I stopped to let a jeep pass through the intersection, then jogged across to the stairs. As I reached the top, I stopped to spare one final glance around. Despite the time crunch, I smiled, almost feeling truly like an adult for the first time in my life. See you tomorrow, I whispered to nobody in particular, then hurried down the steps. The sounds of the world above dulled. As I entered the hallway, my footsteps echoing off the tile walls. Passing by posters for plays and movies, I followed the winding path until it opened into a large welcome area. As I entered, I was hit by a small wave of surprise. Where the hell is everybody? Even this late at night, and with the amount of activity above, I expected there to at least be a few other people rushing for a train home. But as I stared around the large circular room, I saw no sign of life. The only sound was the soft hum of the fluorescent lights on the walls and columns. I gazed around for a moment longer, then began walking, my footfalls again echoing loudly back at me. Fumbling into the pocket of my jeans, I retrieved the crumpled ticket, smoothing it out as best as I could as I approached the gates to the platforms. Oi, the call from behind me made me freeze for a moment, all semblance of thought fleeing. Oh, shit, man. Memories of my mother talking about taking the New York subway as a teenager flooded my mind. Stories about having to watch for armed robbers who'd corner helpless passengers and steal everything from them at knife point. I began to speed walk towards the gates. Stop. I forced myself to turn towards the voice and began to softly laugh, filling with relief at the sight of what had to be a metro cop striding towards me. He appeared to be in his mid-forties, strands of brown hair peeking from under his cap. I shot a look at the name stamped into his vest. D. Giddens. As he approached, he caught sight of the look on my face, and the hardened expression he wore softened as he raised his hands. My apologies, I startle you. Still chuckling, I nodded, swallowing before answering. Honestly, yeah, you did officer. I didn't see anyone else down here when I entered. I gave a strained smile, kinda scared the hell out of me. He let out a chuckle of his own as he finished making his way over to me and flashed a smile. You're an American tourist, aren't you? I nodded again. Yes, sir. Turning, he pointed at the clock hanging from the ceiling. Well, you might not know it, lad, but the station closes in about 20 minutes. The underground doesn't run after midnight or so. A small spike of worry rose at his words. Prep. Eh, doesn't. I asked. He shook his head, rubbing his beard as he looked at me. Where are you needing to go? I need to get back to Chelsea. I took a train from Sloan Square, but that was a different line than this, I think. At my words, a please look crossed the officer's face. You might actually be in luck, he said, pointing at the signs over the escalators heading farther down. The Piccadilly line doesn't stop at Sloan, but it does stop at South Kensington, roughly a 10 minute walk from Chelsea. The last train for the Baker Lou line is already gone, but there's one final westbound train for Piccadilly due in 10 minutes. If you hurry down, you should make it. Just follow the signs. I gave a sigh of relief and nodded, this time giving the cop a genuine smile. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. He nodded, then motioned for me to hurry. Giving him one final look, I turned and stepped up to the gate, sliding my ticket into the slot. It spat it back out, and I quickly slid through and jogged to the escalator. Stepping onto it, I leaned against the railing and closed my eyes. The rhythmic metallic clang filled my ears as I descended. Opening them as I felt it level out, I stepped off and hurried down the corridor. There were three hallways that branched off the main one. The one to the right was already barred off by a gate. The same with the left branch of a fork straight ahead, which left only one choice. Welp, guess I'm going this way. Taking the hallway to the right, I turned left and descended a set of steps. A moment later, I stepped out onto an empty train platform. I felt another wave of confusion. The sign at the top of the stairs said this was the Baker Loo platforms. 
but the cop said to follow the signs for the Piccadilly line. Where the hell am I supposed to go? The answer came as I turned to the left, spying the sign which pointed into yet another hallway. Ah, uh, I muttered, feeling a bit sheepish. I started towards it, feeling a bit sure that I would make it back in time to my aunt and uncle's house on Burnsalson. Scrape. I stopped, almost mid-step as the sound came. It echoed off the tiled walls of the station for a moment, then died away. For a moment, I simply stared ahead, waiting to see if anyone would emerge. Nothing moved in the stillness. Come on, dude, you gotta get to the other platform before the train arrives. I began to move forward again, my boots clapping on the floor. Scrape. This time I froze like a statue. The first time the sound had come, I couldn't figure out exactly where it had originated. The echo had been distorted, but this time it had been much clearer. It had come from ahead, seemingly where the empty platform disappeared around a bend. I felt my pulse quicken slightly and swallowed. For a moment, I contemplated saying nothing. Then I spoke. Hello. My voice echoed off the walls, bouncing back as it died away. Why the hell did you just do that? Haven't you seen enough horror movies? But I shook my head, pushing the thought away. This is real life, not a horror movie. For a moment I continued to stand there, waiting. Nobody answered my call. A mental image of the cop flashed through my mind. Maybe he came down a set of stairs for employees, making sure I'm not going to spray paint the walls or anything. The thought made me call out again. Officer, is that you? Again my voice echoed away into the emptiness, dying away and answered by no one. As I stared, a feeling suddenly fell over me, one that, alone on the platform, was not pleasant in the least. The feeling of being watched. I felt my pulse begin to quicken as it grew, shooting a look over my shoulder to make sure I wasn't being snuck up on. But nobody emerged from the hall behind me. I swung my gaze back, feeling a mixture of weariness and trepidation. And then a sudden loud noise caused me to jump, my heart almost stopping as a booming man's voice shattered the silence. Attention, the final westbound Piccadilly Line train will arrive at the station in three minutes. I repeat, the final westbound Piccadilly train will arrive in three minutes. The sound of the intercom clicked off, and I let out a low, soft laugh as the realization hit me, bending over and putting my hands on my knees. Freaking hell, man. After a moment, I stood back up straight and headed for the hall. As I reached it, I spared one final look down the hall. That noise had to be a fucking rat or something. You are getting way too jumpy. Billy, shaking my head, I entered the hallway, quickly descending a final set of stairs. Quickly scanning the two maps, I found South Kensington on the right and stepped onto the platform. Glancing at my watch, I saw it was now quarter to midnight. The map had said that my stop was only a few stations ahead. That meant a train ride of only about 5 to 10 minutes. After that, it was a quick climb topside, and according to the cop, another 5 minute walk to Chelsea. I'll be home well before curfew. Smiling, I walked over to a bench and sat down, placing my backpack in my lap and waited. Inside the pack I had a Sony Discman, for which I'd purchased two CDs while out with my new friends. But I'd made the decision to wait until I was on the train before breaking it out. As sure as I felt, the noise had been something harmless. I didn't want to deafen myself, not yet. Glancing at my watch, I saw a minute had passed. Feels like hours instead of seconds. Sighing, I leaned back and closed my eyes. Scrape. My eyes flew open again as the sound, now distant and echoing from the upper platform, filtered down to me. I slowly turned my head, looking towards the out of sight alcove about 50 feet to my right. A moment later it came again. I snorted, shaking my head. See, it's either a rat or just the sounds of the underground late at night. But as much as I repeated the thought over and over, I couldn't quite make myself believe it. I can't say why, but it just sounded off. As the noise came a third time, something occurred to me. Is it just me or is that getting louder? I glanced at my watch again. Another minute had passed. If the announcer had been correct, the train would be pulling into the station in 60 seconds. Thank God. I began to stand, but froze as a new sound came. Thunk. Every muscle in my body tensed, and I flashed up lightning quick. What the? For a moment, the air remained still. Then, thunk. 
I suddenly felt my blood run cold as it came a third time, my mind replaying the last few minutes of my journey down. The scraping sound had been one I couldn't place, a sound I'd never heard before and which I could shrug off. But this noise, a very human one, was one I'd heard not even three minutes ago as I descended to the platform. It was the sound of footsteps on the stairs. Shit. At six foot and well built from years on the swim team, not to mention three years of self-defense classes, I felt confident I could hold my own against someone. But the fact I was tipsy and in an unfamiliar space, combined with how brazen whoever it was, to not even try and be quiet, was sending off all kinds of alarm bells in my head. A fourth thunk came, and I made a split second decision, deciding to try and intimidate whoever it might be. I opened my mouth. Okay, whoever's on the fucking stairs, if this is some kind of joke, I can assure you it's not the least bit amusing. Instantly the sound stopped, the platform going silent once more, but this time, it wasn't any normal kind of silence. This was one that held a palpably tense atmosphere, one so thick you could have easily cut it with a knife. For what felt like an eternity, but in reality was likely no more than 10 seconds, it hung over my head like a noose. Then I forced myself to speak again, my voice sounding as tough as I could, and trying not to slur my words. You keep this up, and I'll report this. That is, if I don't kick your fucking ass first. For a few more moments, there was silence. I couldn't tell if they were attempting to quietly make their way back up the stairs, or simply staying still and making their mind up. I shot another glance at my watch. Come on, man, where's the fucking train? As I lifted my head again, the sound suddenly sprang up again. Only this time, they weren't coming slowly, one after the other. They were coming rapidly. Thunk, 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 thunk. My eyes widened as I suddenly realized how big a mistake I'd made. You fucking moron. You just pissed them off. I began to backpedal down the platform as the sounds drew closer. Oh shit. Oh shit I kept repeating the two words, fear suddenly coursing through my veins. As I reached the halfway point, they reached the bottom and stopped. I stopped as well, freezing and straining my ears to hear anything. No new sounds disturbed the eerie silence that had descended onto the platform, but all it meant was that the person was standing just out of sight, waiting. For what? The mental question made the fear and anxiety well up like a hot spring as images of being rushed filled my mind. I swallowed hard and took another step back. That was when I felt a large puff of air hit me, causing me to sway slightly on my feet. It was followed by a loud, echoing sound which rapidly intensified. For a moment, I didn't understand what was happening. Then relief like I'd never felt before came as the train burst out of the tunnel, the platform filling with the sound of its brakes. Even so, I kept shooting looks towards the stairs. I gave a silent thanks as I saw nobody appear. The train finally came to a complete stop the doors opening with a whoosh. A speaker inside let out a small ding, followed by a soothing woman's voice. This train terminates at Heathrow Terminal 4. I shot another glance down at the other end of the platform. Then I began to move towards the open doors. As I was about to enter, something came flying out of nowhere, smacking itself square in my chest. For a moment, panic consumed me before I looked down and let out a shaky chuckle as I realized it was some sort of paper likely blown about by the train. Pulling it from my chest and holding it in one clenched hand, I spared a final look towards the alcove. Then, I quickly stepped inside. The doors slid shut a moment later, the loud humming sound of the train powering back up filling my ears. Feeling the floor below me jerk slightly, I slid the paper in my pocket and quickly sat down on one of the benches. The platform began sliding by outside, and was replaced a few seconds later by the blackness of the underground tunnels. After a moment, confident that I hadn't been followed, I allowed my shoulders to slump as all the fear and tension I'd felt flowed out of my body like water. Water. A huge sigh escaped my lips. Holy shit, dude I muttered softly, then let out an equally soft, strained laugh. Taking another few deep breaths, I finally allowed myself to look around. Aside from myself, the car was completely empty. Abandoned newspapers lay where people had discarded them, and what looked like a styrofoam coffee cup rolled lazily under one of the patterned seats. Leaning around, I saw through the glass doors to both adjoining cars that they too were empty. You're safe, men. The thought further reassured me, and I set my backpack aside and stood up, holding onto the metal bar running along the ceiling. As I studied the map, 
gap on the far wall. My eyes moved along the line. Okay, three stops before Kensington, I said, making a mental note of them. Green Park, Hyde Park Corner, and Knightsbridge. Sitting back down in my seat as I felt the adrenaline which had filled my body begin to recede. Replaced with a sudden tiredness, I reached over and unzipped my bag, pulling out my disc man and the two CDs I'd bought. Depeche Mode or Tears for Fears. I settled on Depeche Mode, popping the CD inside the disc man. Placing the headphones on my head, I hit play. A moment later, my ears were filled with the sound of Dave Gahan's voice as he began to sing World in My Eyes. Leaning back in my seat, I closed my eyes. As I listened, feeling my body rock slightly with the train, I decided that I wouldn't tell my parents what had happened to me with the way they were. The news that I'd been accosted by an unseen presence would send them off the deep end. And I'd absolutely be forbidden from going to the movies with Courtney this weekend. Like hell that's happening. I felt the train begin to slow. Opening my eyes and lifting one headphone, I watched as the empty platform rolled into view. The train stopped and the doors opened. The woman's voice came from the train speakers again. This is Green Park. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. After about 10 seconds, the doors closed and the train began to move again. I slid the headphone back over my ear and relaxed again. The process repeated as the train rolled into Hyde Park Station. As the doors closed, I slid the headphone back on and leaned back, closing my eyes, enjoying the silence and began blasting music into my ears. One more stop. Thank you, God, for watching out for me tonight. Behind my eyelids, I could still faintly see the glow of the lights. As I began to bob my head back and forth to the music, I suddenly realized they had winked out. They came back on a moment later. Guess the London Underground is like the NYC subway. Certain spots, they hid and the lights flicker. As the thought finished, they again flickered. In any other situation, and after a lifetime of riding the subway back home, it wouldn't have bothered me. But after my close call, it began to make me feel nervous again. My mind suddenly recalled the paper I'd been hit with, and to try and take my mind off things, I pulled it from my pocket to look at it. It was a program for a play, similar to one my parents and I had received a few nights ago when they dragged me to a theater in the West End. The top of the program gave the name of the theater in dark red font. Her Majesty's Theater, Haymarket, SWJ. I swung my gaze down to the title, reading it aloud. Jack Hilton presents Diana Doors and Dickie Henderson and remains to be seen. I shrugged my shoulders. Never heard of it before or either of the actors. Local talent, likely. My eyes fell even further down to the bottom and I began to read the line which stated its opening date and froze. I blinked my eyes a few times as if doing so would change what I saw, but it didn't. The small black lettering remained. First performance, Tuesday, the 16th of December, 1952. My mind raced. What the, how in the hell is something as old as this still floating around down here? It doesn't even look 46 years old. It looks new. Feeling my head begin to spin, I leaned back in my seat and closed my eyes. As I attempted to make sense of it, the lights again flickered for a moment, plunging the car back into darkness before flashing on again. As soon as they did, though, I felt my body tense. Something in the train car now felt different. I snapped open my eyes as the feeling intensified. I looked to my left. There was still nobody in sight in the next car. I let out a sigh. It's your nerves from earlier, man. Nothing more. Forcing another sigh out my mouth, I swung my head to the right and I had to clamp my mouth tightly shut to keep from screaming. I wasn't alone anymore. Someone sat in the far end of the car. Their face was hidden by the hood of a sweatshirt, one of the zip-up styles the kids at my school loved to wear. They appeared to pay me no attention, but the vibes they were giving off was putting me extremely on edge. Not to mention, where exactly the hell did they come from? Nobody got on board at the last stop and I have sensed someone entering from one of the other cars. A thought suddenly wormed its way forward, and as much as I attempted to force it away, it remained. It's the person from the platform. The idea suddenly caused every ounce of fear and wariness to return with a vengeance. The same threatening aura I'd felt staring at the alcove was unmistakable, cementing the notion. But I forced myself to stay still, acting like I either hadn't noticed them yet or simply didn't care. Just keep looking like you don't give a damn, Billy. Show some of the apathy that you New Yorkers are famous for. I slowly shut off the music, pulling the headphones from my head and placing it back in my backpack. Reaching over, I picked up one of the discarded newspapers from the seat next to me, flipping it open and pretending to read. 
I kept it just far enough from my face to glance at the figure out of the corner of my eye. They continued to sit, that only movement being the slight rocking of their body. As I continued to flick my gaze back and forth, I felt the train begin to slow again. We were arriving at the next platform. The woman's voice came over the speakers again. This is Knightsbridge. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. Sure enough, the platform slid into view a moment later, the train rolling to a stop and the doors opening. As I stared at what felt like salvation, I mentally argued over what to do. I can just get out dash to the stairs, try and make it to the street before he catches me, but for all I know, doing so could make him rush me. Besides, turning your back to this guy, where they appeared out of nowhere, on the train, doesn't just feel like a big mistake, it feels like it might be a fatal one. To this very day, I wish I hadn't fought with myself. I wish I'd simply jumped up, grabbed my bag and ran. The choice was made for me, as I hesitated a moment too long. The doors slid shut, and the train began to hum and jerk forward. We we slid back into the dark tunnels. The woman's voice came on the speaker again. The next stop is South Kensington Station. Far from making me feel better, the announcement caused the fear to further intensify. If anything was going to happen, it would be between now and the next station. I kept calm, turning the page of the newspaper. I spared a look over at the figure and couldn't help but stare. They'd pulled something out of their pocket. Something dark red, rectangular and about the size of their hand, with three circular rings in the top left corner. As I watched, I saw the person tap their thumbs against the other side of it for a moment, then stop and gaze at it. I caught a split second glimpse of what looked to be some kind of a logo stamped on the back. Then they replaced it back in their pocket. Confusion swept through me. What the hell was that thing? I forced my gaze away, turning to continue pretending to read. I'd already felt afraid to begin with at the figure's sudden appearance. After that bizarre spectacle, it had ramped up a few notches, and it was furthered as the lights flickered again, sending the train car into darkness. My heart beat furiously against my chest, feeling as though it would burst out of it at any moment. The lights returned, and I cast my eye to the side. The figure still sat where they were. The lights flickered again. I gave a fake, exasperated sigh as if annoyed. My reading had been interrupted. The lights flickered on again and I shot a glance to the right and froze. The seat where the figure had been, not even five seconds ago, was empty. My eyes darted around every possible area they could have hid in the few moments they'd had, but I saw no feet poking from the bottom of seats. Hello. The voice, a man's, came from directly in front of me, behind the newspaper. Shiver after shiver shot up my spine. Fear and terror filled every fiber of my being, and I saw my hands begin to shake violently. Slowly I lowered the paper, my breath coming in ragged gasps as I looked looked up. The hood still hid the upper half of his face, but I could clearly see the psychotic grin which adorned the lower. A horrifying realization hit me like a Mack truck. This isn't any ordinary nut job. This guy is giving off fucking serial killer vibes. And then my gaze fell to the man's right hand. Or, I should be more specific and say what he held in his right hand. A knife, its serrated blade curving wickedly upwards. My eyes widened as far as they could go. For a few moments, neither of us moved. Then, I spoke, my voice coming out in a weak tone. Oh shit. I exploded into motion, using all the muscle in my legs to spring forward and off to the side. From the corner of my eye, I saw the figure lunge towards where I'd just been. The knife stabbed the seat, tearing it apart like it was paper. That was going to be me. The thought sent a new burst of adrenaline into my system, and I leapt to my feet as the figure pulled back, whirling to face me. All the knowledge from my self-defense classes flooded back to me, and I moved into position, centering my legs. The man's grin widened as he watched me and he chuckled. Good. Been a while since I had a bit of a challenge. Then he charged me again. I spun on one heel, whirling around, and allowing the man's momentum to carry him past me. As soon as he was, I lashed out with my other foot, the steel-toed boot slamming into the back of the man's calf. He let out a grunt as he fell to one knee, almost dropping the knife. Then he sprang back to his feet, whirling around, and slashing out at me. I backpedaled hard, having to jerk my upper body back a few times to avoid the blade. As soon as I saw an opening, I pivoted, bringing up one foot and slamming it into his chest. 
caught by surprise, he let out a bit of a yell as he almost went ass over tea kettle, only stopping as he grabbed the railing. Pulling himself up, I saw his grin widen further. I'm impressed, he chuckled again. My blood ran cold at his next words. I'm truly going to enjoy gutting you. I backed up again, ready for the man's next charge. What happened next, I still can't fully explain. One moment, the man was readying his next charge. The next, it was as if he simply appeared directly in front of me. Shock stunned me and I hesitated just a moment too late. A searing pain filled my left shoulder and I stumbled back, clamping my hand to it as I felt blood begin to drip profusely from the slash. I snapped my head up to look at the man, who now held the knife out towards me, the blade dripping with blood. My blood. Playtime's over, kid. He said through insane giggles. As he began to move forward, a small, hopeless voice entered my mind. I'm going to die. I'm not fast enough. I'm going to die here. As I felt despair begin to overtake me, the sound of the announcer's voice filled the train car. This is South Kensington Station. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. The realization of how close I was to the platform suddenly banished away the voice telling me to give up, instead replaced with a furious determination I didn't realize I possessed. I saw the first lights of the platform appear, but I remained still. I have to time this perfectly. Just one single misstep and I'm dead. The knife rose, ready to slice into my neck, and I made my move. I exploded into motion, first pivoting and lashing out with my right foot. A moment later, a sickening crack filled the train car as his leg either snapped or popped out of its socket. At the same time, I snapped up with my left elbow, aiming for his right wrist. Again, my aim proved true, and the knife flew out of his hand, embedding itself in the seat beside him. I heard him begin to let out a howl of pain and rage, but I wasn't through yet. I had one final move to keep him down long enough for me to escape. My left hand lashed out, grabbing the front of his hoodie as my right hand into a fist. I pulled back, putting every ounce of strength I had into it, and swung. The blow connected with the man's head, sending him flying backwards. There was a tearing sound, and I felt his hoodie split as I continued to hold it in a death grip. It tore from my grasp, and he fell to the floor in a heap, the hood sliding from his face as it fell apart. His eyes flew up to meet mine, insanity filling them as he continued to grin. My jaw dropped open. For a moment, I felt rooted to the spot as my eyes flicked back and forth, unable to look away. I only snapped out of it as I realized the man was beginning to attempt to stand up and heard the whoosh of the doors opening. I didn't hesitate any longer. I leapt over the man and snatched up my pack, sprinting for the doors as I heard the ding signifying they were about to close. I leapt through them, falling to the floor of the platform in a heap and spinning to see them close. From inside the car, just audible over the hum of the train powering up, I heard the man let out another scream of rage. Rage at having lost his prey, and then the train pulled away. A few moments later, it disappeared into the blackness of the far tunnel. For a few more moments I stared, then I slowly climbed to my feet, holding one hand tight to the still bleeding gash in my shoulder. That horrific night was 26 years ago. After I got up, I raced topside, where I found the nearest phone box and called the police. Quite a few of them showed up, more than I assumed, along with an ambulance. They took my story extremely seriously, sending some men down into the station as they ordered armed police to Heathrow. Then they took me to the hospital. It took almost 70 stitches to sew up my shoulder. They also called my parents. I still remember how my Mom cried as she clutched me like a shipwreck victim to a life ring. Never have I ever seen either of them that afraid. Courtney had a similar expression when she came to visit a few days later after showing up unannounced to my aunt and uncle's house. The only good thing that came out of my stay in the hospital was it was where she and I had our first kiss. The first of many. The cops never found him. They were waiting to check every car top to bottom when it arrived at its final stop but they never found a trace of him, aside from the shredded seats he'd slashed into. I knew they wouldn't, not after what I'd seen, and when an older officer came to take my statement again, it was confirmed as he admitted something. What I'm about to tell you, son, stays between you and me. We've had unsolved murders occur on the tube for at least the last 70 years, if not longer. They've never made the paper, and they've always had the same MO. Person goes into a station late at night, 
is caught on the cameras talking to someone, then goes down to the platform. The last place any of them have been seen alive is entering the train. I'm 44 years old now. As odd as it may seem, and despite what happened, I ended up moving to London after graduating college. Courtney and I ended up marrying one another, our summertime fling leading to a love that has lasted almost 30 years, along with three amazing kids. Every day I spent with them makes me thankful I never gave up that night but I don't take the underground anymore. I never will, and I forbade Courtney or any of our kids from taking it either. You see, the police ran a check after I told my story, and they found there was no man with either the Metropolitan Police or the Transit Police named D. Giddens. There never had been, but it makes sense. The best way to gain a person's trust is to look like an authority figure. That's why, when the hoodie tore and his face snapped up to glare at me, I couldn't help but gasp as I recognized him, the same green eyes and beard. I was never able to figure out what he'd been doing though, what he'd been tapping on before he came for me, no one I spoke to could either. I honestly ended up thinking I'd just been seeing things. I don't anymore, because my wife brought home a birthday present for our oldest daughter today. When she was presented the box, she let out a squeal of delight that caused me to smile, but it was wiped away as she opened it and pulled the smartphone out, one that was a very familiar shape, with an equally familiar logo adorning the back. Even though it was a brand new iPhone, I'd seen it before, decades ago. They say in modern times, it's becoming harder for serial killers to operate without being caught. All the advancements in forensics, all the cameras everywhere and social media have created a world in which they can't get away with their crimes as easily. But what if they didn't have to? The thought makes me terrified. Not for the future, but the past. Why? Because of the other thing I saw that night, as I stared down at my attempted murderer, at the shirt he wore underneath the torn hoodie, one which advertised the grand opening of some business. In July 2025, Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacey, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.